to say that you know bricks and mortar is over, it, it'll never recover. I just I just don't buy it. That's like saying that that restaurants will shut down and all we'll do is live off takeaways forever. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast, and this week's guest is a 26-year veteran in the Asia health and fitness industry. Now the CEO of Evolution Wellness created from a $500 million merger of the Fitness First Asia and Celebrity Fitness brands. Evolution Wellness is a leading player in the category with a six brand portfolio across 175 sites in six countries with 7,000 employees and over 300 million in revenue. Please enjoy this week's Escape Your Limits podcast with Mr. Simon Flint. Simon Flint, thank you for joining us today on the Escape Your Limits podcast. And um, where in the world are you today, Simon? I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which is which is my home. Very good. So, how, how long have you been out in uh, Kuala Lumpur? Uh, you know, every time someone asks me that question, I say it's it's uh, it's about ten years. But I've been saying that for a number of years, <laughs> so uh, it's probably more like thirteen. I, I think now. Uh, I don't keep a track, but I've been in Southeast Asia since 1994. Um, and I, I was very fortunate enough to spend some time in my first job in, on the beautiful island of Phuket in Thailand and then moved to Bangkok uh, for some time and uh, then came to Kuala Lumpur uh, when we started to get a little bit bigger, uh, which is where we, we have a, a support office which supports our regional operations. Right. And and so what was a, as an ex-Brit then, I, I guess, you know, doing business in Asia is pretty interesting and exciting but what, what's it like when you when you're going through what we are at the moment you know how how do things change is it sort of better easier worse what's it like um in in terms of the in terms of our little covid crisis piece you mean yeah yeah um so uh, you know i when i you know of course I, I i'm still in touch with the the uk which is where i'm from so i i watch i watch what happens on the news and I have friends and, and uh, contacts in the industry, so I can you know compare and contrast. And we have six markets over here, so some of our markets are, are similar to the UK. Others are a little bit different. So it's really a mixed bag at the moment. Um, so uh, for Evolution Wellness, we have we have operations in six countries. We have Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. And as we speak at the moment, um, we are we're in, in mid August as we as we speak now. Uh, we are open in sort of three and a half markets, if you like, and the half is Indonesia, where Jakarta has still got some serious uh, restrictions. Um, so, and we have been open in some and closed again. That would be uh, Hong Kong, case in point. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we were due to open on, on a Monday in the Philippines. And in the middle of the night, we had notification that the decision was to be reversed from the government level from the ministerial level and it was it was all off again so it's been a very very touch and go uh few months few weeks uh and you know i can look at it from two angles when i and uh, you know to be very honest i i vacillate from optimism and pe pe pessimism in, in in a very short space of time um and that depends on the news we get right <laughs> if, you know to, to, to be optimistic i can say that um you know, we fundamentally underneath all of this, our industry has to be more important than it ever has been. Um, and I get the sense from some some early evidence that there's some pent up demand uh, from people who are saying, well, I, I've dodged a bullet this time around. I don't want to be in a comorbidity category or I don't want to be, you know, not not being as healthy as I, as I perhaps should be if this kind of stuff is going to repeat itself. Um, and we see that in in. Um, uh, you know, a good performance in Thailand, for example, where we uh, where we're open again, and there's a there's a clear correlation between what's happening in the market with respect to the pandemic and what's happening in in our business performance wise. So we um, we're open in in all of our clubs. We have 34 clubs over there, and the check in rates are commensurate with pre COVID, more or less, even though we have restrictions uh, in place. Um, we see people spread out coming at different times of the day. We're fortunate that we've got reasonably big footprint uh, clubs in Thailand, so we, we've got the space to accommodate people in, in a you know personal kind of bubble um, with the social distancing that's that's required. Um, we are a little bit under capacity in, in the group concept in the group format. Um, 
but again, we're layering on additional classes. Um, we're able to to provide a, a pretty good service. So we feel we feel pretty optimistic that when the environment allows itself to for us to reopen and be anything like normal, the demand is clearly there, um, despite the you know the the economic impact that's happened so far. Um, it's yet to be seen what's going to happen in the other markets. It's a very mixed bag. If I can give you some some feedback from the Malaysia market, perhaps um, we see uh, a higher number of people who are remaining on freeze. So circa 12% of our membership uh, remains on uh, on freeze. It started at 30%, I should say. So it's kind of winding down. But you get segments of the of the population who are still in the um, I'm going to wait and see category, or perhaps uh, they might have elderly family members at home or kids at home. And there's this this little fear factor that's still there that they may not wish to go back and potentially uh, become ill, pass it on to other members in the family. So um, it's it's a really mixed bag. And our focus has been to, to to have our staff understand and play a part in feeling super confident about the measures we're taking. We want our clubs to be as clean and as safe uh, as, as anywhere people can possibly be. And then that confidence projected on the members who come and try it out, uh, you know, they then convey that to their friends and, and other members. And that sort of perpetuates the, the increase in, in check-ins and the reduction of, uh, of the freeze statistics. So, you know, there's, there are good signs, uh, but at the same time, you know, when we open in a, in a country and then we, we, we're instructed to close again very quickly, that's when I put a, a, a pessimistic hat on for a moment. Um, and, you know, I think in generally in life I'm an optimist, but but I, I would be I would be kidding if if I said there aren't some sort of dark moments when you think you know when is this going to end? Because when we're when we're closed, we're zero revenue, uh, mm. and and that that's not a business. Mm. You, you, I'm sure you keep up to date with the situation in in the UK. Um, how do you how do you see some of the governments in you know being spread across six different countries? Do you, do you see a lot of similarities between the way that that the governments are working with businesses like like in the fitness sector, or are you seeing some that are doing things uh, differently in any way? In, in general terms, I know there's some sort of specific details, but generally, are they sort of approaching things in a similar way? Would you say? Well, the government's response tends to be um, very much a product of of their financial capability and their organizational capability to respond. So um, if I were to take um, the the Hong Kong and Singapore governments, for example, um, they appear to be very well organized, very well, uh, very communicative and erring on the side of caution, perhaps more than more than others. Um, very involved in protocols, standard operating procedures, and um, you know, broadly speaking, on on the front foot with you know, we think this is what we should do. Uh, other countries uh, have been a little bit more. There is no SOP. We, we don't have a position, so um, we have been more, let's say, proactive and and thankfully we've had access at the ministerial level. Um, sometimes independently as, as one of our brands or, or in coalition with um, with industry peers. And we've managed to to get audience uh, time with them. In fact, our Malaysia team literally uh, visited uh, one of the ministries with with many present. There are several who are involved in the decisions to to open and to as to what SOPs will be in place. Um, and thankfully, a lot of hard work done by the the Malaysia team meant that the SOPs were created and then adopted and sort of signed off, endorsed by the government, and then implemented as as standard practice for the industry. Um, so, we, we thankfully we've had that level of access to be able to to help move things along. I dare say that we we, we may not be open yet if we weren't able to have that. Then, of course, we have inspections. The government comes and and um, you know I, I must say uh, let me use Malaysia as an example. Um, I think the, the you look at the case numbers, and at the moment we look at our phone every day and, and see what's happening. And you might get single digits or low double digits. And when it gets up to maybe you know twenty cases a day, we're saying, "Ooh, you know, we're kind of gritting our teeth a little bit." But you contrast that to somewhere in Europe, and it, it's it's an entirely different scenario. So I think the expectations and the standards are even higher over here. So you know, credit to to what what many of the governments have, have managed to achieve. Others, I have to say, you know, it, it's been um, 
far less organized. And I think the key here is communication. Where communication is clear, where communication is proactive, then at least you know where you stand and you can do something. But when there's silence or there's one message from one ministerial body and the absolute opposite message from another in the same government, then it's rather difficult to know where you stand. And that's that's when it becomes, you know, pretty tiring for the teams to 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 figure out where the uh, where the path is going. Mm. I know one of the things we've seen in, in the US with um, certain states opening and closing is that the, the, lo- the local authorities, for example, are, are looking at uh, all gyms as being the same. So you've got the good ones that are really managing things well and, and putting all the correct procedures in place and then other ones that are kind of just you know, probably being a little bit more relaxed. Are, are you seeing out there that they're, and, and from, from what I know from you guys, you're, you're certainly one of the ones that are doing things right. But are you are you seeing the government sort of looking at the gym industry all together and saying, well, you know, basing it on the ones probably that may not be quite as good as you are, or are you being able to sort of position yourselves as, uh, you know, sort of separate from um, from the rest of the bunch as an example? We have seen elements of that very point where um, I, I, w- I won't mention the, the country or, or the government in, in, in question there, but we had... We had one situation where we were kind of, um, uh, let's say, looked upon not very favorably and, and, and spoken about in words that were, you know, we, we, could, we could have easily taken offense, let's say. But what we did um, and the team did in the Philippines was invite uh, the Department of Trade and Industry, actually, as, a, as an example there. We invited the, uh, the DTI in to, to come and have a look at a working scenario. So... Uh, an example of what it would look like with people on treadmills, they're wearing a mask, they're two meters apart, you know, the people in this cycling class, the bikes have been reduced in number. And so we had a, a very good interaction um, as one of the more positive uh, cases in, in the Philippines there where they came and inspected and said, yes, we like this, let's adopt this, let's do that, let's do the other. And then there were some areas where they said, um, look, I think this is the right way to do it. And, and you've you know, shown a good example, but at the moment we prefer uh, that you you don't, open group exercise, for example, um, which, so I, as we sit here today, um, I'm, I'm hearing, this is an example of how things chop and change. I'm now hearing that the Philippines will come out of lockdown tomorrow and we may be able to open on Thursday, but without group exercise. Mm-hmm. So again, when you think that, you know, broadly speaking, those, those bigger box businesses that have a good component of group exercise, there's normally a majority of members who partake regularly as, you know, group exercise is their thing. Therefore, if you don't have that, you're, you're clearly a very compromised business in terms of your ability to generate revenue, unless every member who was doing group exercise will switch to a more floor-based bit of cardio, a bit of weights, strength training, that kind of thing. Um, and in which case, if they do, you then have some space dynamics that you have to figure out because, of course, you've, you've got an increased density um, when you have to have reduced numbers. So... Um, Hopefully, people spreading out the time of the day that they come is going to be uh, particularly important. And to facilitate that, we did some rapid development work with our app um, a lot faster than we planned. We planned a sort of gentle rollout of our new app, actually, from Q1 across into, uh, into Q2 around the region. But because of the situation, we had to go hard and fast and deploy across all markets to, to enable the the gym booking concept. So normally you'd book into a personal training class or book into a, a group exercise class. We had to launch a, a gym booking slot too, so we could manage the right number of people uh, in and out. So so that's in play now. But as you can imagine, you know when you you have a, a group of coders who are who are writing to on a, on a schedule and you say, okay, that schedule just got squashed by fivefold. Let's go. You know that's that's a tough gig. Mm. Um, so we had a few bumps in the road uh, with that, but thankfully that's settled now and that's facilitating um, a smoother process for the members. Mm. And what about the experience? So you have you guys having to wear masks when you're working out? I know here I've, I've just been on holiday myself and I, each state seems to be different, but they, they seem to have the rule where, you know, if you're on cardio, you don't have to wear a mask, but if you're in the strength of the functional, you do. Um, what, what, what's, what are the rules that, that you guys are working to with masks? 
it's again, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag. But generally speaking, the rule is you wear a mask on arrival. You can remove it for exercise, uh, and then you you put it on as you leave and you're in transition, passing people maybe near the door or that kind of thing. Mm. Um, we also have um, a, a kind of um, a rate of exertion index, which kind of suggests that that you know it may not be safe if you're indexing above five and six out of ten, for example. It may not be uh, ideal to be to be wearing a mask. We'd encourage people to wear one when you can at all times. Mm. But if you're if you're exerting yourself in a certain way, that may not be you know healthy in other ways, and you may end up uh, getting a little bit overheated and uh, etc. So those are the guidelines we've put in place. But generally speaking, um, people are um, wearing masks when they're not really exerting themselves, which is a good thing. And I, I think it's it's been great to see the amount of compliance and kind of you know social conscience in the way that people have behaved there are one or two kind of outliers who will argue don't tell me to put my mask on or this that and the other but they really are outliers um for the most part we've been really impressed at the way members have come together and, and you know just taken it upon themselves to be responsible as an individual and therefore collectively we we have you know pretty safe outlets um I, i'm i'm hoping actually that we can in, in a not so uh, not so distant future, uh, try and get some data on on how safe our, our gyms are. It seems as though the government data in many countries is fairly clear as to where cases are. Um, therefore, we can map against our, our localities. And um, given that I don't personally, and, and you know my my peer group don't know anyone who knows anyone who's who's had COVID, um, it seems as though we're you know we 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 may be in in you know, a safe spot, so to speak. So notwithstanding, it's still out there and, you know, it causes terrible damage to, to some, some who get it. And, uh, we've got to, we've got to maintain that sense of responsibility in a way that allows us to build our business back to a sustainable level. Um, mm -hmm. and there's, there's, there is quite a long way to go yet. We've got to get back to a sensible capacity in order to, um, to thrive as an industry. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got six brands from what I understand, which are sort of fairly different um and if, if if my research is correct how how have the different brands i, I guess uh, when when they've been able to open that is but how have they sort of fared and wh which ones do you think are probably going to be a little bit more um able to sort of ride some of the the, the challenges that that are being set up on it you know i know for example you've got the the, the fire boutique brand which I, which i guess is sort of a studio concept we were talking about previously you know do you, do you think things like the boutique are gonna struggle a little bit more compared to some of your you know you sort of like your fitness first brand as an example yeah by by nature the boutique businesses uh, can can be a little bit harder to to um get back to a, an acceptable level because first of all being small footprint the the space that's afforded to the the individual members perhaps less than, than than a big box if you like but the the most impactful uh, factor is that when people come they're coming to attend a class every single time they're not coming to you know go onto a, a gym floor and do their own thing so the big box big boxes tend to have an advantage in that that sort of structural respect um, having said that we have uh, layered on additional classes and we are we're creeping up to um, close to the maximum capacity of the capacity that we're allowed today. So again, you know, under, underneath it all, we we feel positive that the demand is there. Um, and it, you know, again, at the, at the boutique level, it's a bit more premium. Um, so that's that's comforting to know that it's there. It's just a question of being able to, you know, ease back on these restrictions. So that we can get to a point where um, businesses are, are viable, um, I, I I can't say really that across the other brands there's a there's a clearly distinct difference because there's a little bit of demographic aspect where where you know like I mentioned before if you've got a group of people who fit in that age group where they may have elderly parents at home they're affected in different ways than others irrespective of the brand. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we look at GoFit, which is our um, low price high value brand. Um, we, we've seen there that there's a, there's a real keenness to, to get back and numbers have been fairly buoyant. Um, but at another brand, which is at the, at the lower end, um, we've been affected slightly more. So there's, there are, um, there's a, it, it's really mixed. 
Uh, and we see a little bit of both in at, at each level where, where there's a, you know, at the top of the chart where, uh, you know, finance is less of an issue. There's less of an impact in people's propensity to come, to come back and, and spend with us. It's our capacity. That's the limitation. Mm -hmm. Some of the brands at the lower end have seen people being a bit more price sensitive who maybe have been affected, you know, possibly with their job. And that's been an impact. Um, but others who are using the, the high value, low price concept as, as just a means to be smart and not spend uh, as much on fitness, um, you know, they're, they're straight back and, and we, we feel comfortable that that's, uh, that's in a good place. Mm. What's, what's your capacity in, in the um, boutiques and how, how many, what, what are you allowed to, to have in as part of your full ca capacity? Um, so we're, we're more or less 50%. Um, it, it's, it can be slightly different depending on the spacing, but, but we're, we're generally half and uh, our biggest class um, would be at our, uh, our, one of our bigger, bigger fire stations, as you call them. That would take 24 people normally. Um, and others vary, uh, you know, our bar studio takes, takes 12, for example. Mm. So, um, I, I think there, you know, if, if, if it goes on and on, we then have to look at yield and mm. clearly if, if, if we, we are to go forward and continue sustainably, we have to nudge up the yield. And, and I, I believe that members will understand that, um, it, you know, it's, it's just not possible to, to operate a business that that uh, is not profitable, so we've got to be able to balance that equation. We've we've um, we've discussed that that opportunity, and it, you know our first step has been to deploy the virtual opportunity for members, um, and we've got uh, an interesting little pilot running at the moment where we have a kind of triple branded studio where we're doing virtual for fitness first, celebrity fitness, and and fire. Um, and we've got reasonable traction to start with. And we're, we're I say reasonable because, um, you know, we, we, we want to get thousands of people on it um, for it to be a, a truly viable business. Um, we believe that we're going to reach a, a break even at the end of this month. We're on track for that. And you may say, well, you know, the overheads may be quite light, but the studio itself involves quite a bit of investment. There's some, you know, to do it properly in 4K with the right quality audio, there's quite a bit of capital involved. And of course, to the best trainers um, is a variable cost. So um, it's you know th th there's still a business to be to be created there. But that's that's looking interesting. And with our firebrand, for example, we we we've not done any paid media um, overseas at this point. But we've seen people from as far away as Australia, UK, Honduras, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, um, and. That was really interesting to see we're getting some traction there. So mm. who knows if we uh, if we you know do a little bit of paid media and try and push it a bit, we could we could get some really good reach, and that that's particularly encouraging because you know I'm sure you, you've spoken to a lot of people about this, and and you as well as anybody will know that the the content that's available, um, either video on demand, premium, paid for, or just you know, YouTube bloggers all over the place. There's a ton of content out there. Um, and it's easy to have free content or pay a bit for some really good content. So to, to cut through and to be able to scale your brand content and take it beyond borders, um, I think is a really big prize. Uh, and it's not easy to come by. So the quality has got to be great. The, the, um, every single time the, the engagement has got to be fabulous. And there's, there's a big difference between, you know, being engaging on a stage and, and engaging to a, to a virtual audience. And it's, we're finding that some of those who are, you know, absolute showmen and women on stage may not quite have the same presence. And, and others who may be the other way around can, can be a little bit more engaging in the virtual world. So there's a, there's a little contrast we're, we're finding there. It's not easy, right, when you can't see somebody. Um, you know, I can, I can see you now, uh, so we can have a, a conversation as, as if we're in the same or, you know, almost, but if, if you know that there are a lot of people out there, but you can't really see anybody that's, that's different because instructors feed off the, the vibe of the, of the, uh, the studio audience. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's a learning as well. Um, but I think if, if we can, if we can carry on making progress there, then that will be a big win and, and you know, a, quite a necessary win, to be honest, because when you're 177 bricks and mortar um, outlets and we're in the situation we're in now, um, we, need to, we need to switch up the business and look for other ways to, to thrive. 
Mm. It's an interesting one. It's something that I know a lot of people have been thinking about and I've had lots of conversations and it's, I guess, <clears throat> you're right, you know, there there is a big investment to do it correctly, albeit it's probably a lot less than building out a studio, you know, to have a certain amount of people from a geographical area. Um, but I, I, I guess it's, it's you know, I, some people are looking at it as a service to provide their existing members. I, I, how are you guys looking at digital? Are you, are you looking at it as, as the ability to, I suppose, grow the amount of members that you have um, that are aware of you, you know, outside of a, of a bricks and mortar location? Or is it more to say, look, we, we want to find ways of adding value to the current model or, or, or combination of both? Well, ultimately, it's both. But but in the first instance, it's very much the member base that we're wishing to serve in, in other ways. Um, so I mentioned before, we have a percentage of members on freeze um, where we're open. Um, that freeze number has come down to what might be considered normal. At any one time, about 6% of the membership base is on time freeze. That's a, that's a paid time freeze where they pay a, a small percentage to maybe they're you know, being transient or they've got a, an overseas trip or, or whatever it may be. That's that's kind of a normal practice, and where we're where we're fully open, we're we're back to that level. But where we're not, and those people are saying, I'm, "I just want to wait and see." We surveyed the member base, and we had a, a healthy number of respondents to say that they would be very interested to take up some virtual options as a supplement to their core bricks and mortar membership. And we asked, you know, in what circumstances might you do that? And the answers were, well, if I'm uh, if I'm too busy and I miss a class that I was supposed to go to, or if I'm not able to get into a class, then that to me would be a good option just to pick up an extra class at home. So that's the first audience that we wish to serve. And in getting feedback from the audience as to how was it, how did you find it, what could make it better, then logically, because you've got the sunken cost, you've got the sunken cost of the studio and the, the capital to put it all together, and ultimately, the platform upon which to consume it, because personally, I don't see that, you know, social media streaming is is the is the end game. I think you've got to have a, a home in place for your content for members to to engage with, and therefore you've got the you know the member engagement uh, patterns and data that that helps you too. Um, that that would be the end game. But it, at the moment, it's just just getting that extra bit of value for the loyal members who've been with us for years, um, so that they can stay with us, and then from there we branch out. Mm. I was listening to an interview when I was preparing for this, another one you'd done, and you, although you didn't reference the book, I, I, I thought it sounded something similar to a book that I read about. I think it's called Play to Win. Um, is that is that a book, yes. book you've read? Okay, and yeah. and it was it was about well, you, you obviously know know the book, but when, so when when you guys are looking at, at strategies, is is that very much the approach that you and your your team take? It's like look, if we're gonna if we're gonna enter this market. That you know we we're, we're playing to win as opposed to playing to be and also ran is is that the the mindset of your I guess leadership team? It it yeah it's it's um it's something that uh, we in fact we all read the book it was kind of uh, it was it was a bit of a diktat from above that was hey you know this is this is worth a read and 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 it was um, and it, I in an ideal situation been very honest it, it, yes it is. It's not always as easy to do that because playing to win, you know, let me, let me give you an example. If you take the, uh, you know, a startup, if we're going to play in this space, we need to play to win. What do people do? They raise money. They raise money so they can win market share, so they can develop and innovate at super fast speed and, and go beyond minimum viable product to market. So it's, it's generally an investment game to, to really go hard on playing to win. But the mindset is very important to have because it, it asks you, you know, to, to scrutinize Take the virtual group exercise. Well, how are we going to win? Are we going to win by filming with our, our mobile phone and having um, you know breakages in the in the connections and crackling voices and um, you know studios that are not necessarily lit well and don't have the right environment? What does playing to win look like? And you can either ideate that yourselves and amongst you, your groups, or you can ask. You can ask your audience, your your potential audience. What would it take for you to engage and pay this amount for a product? Um, and then you can determine at least what the ingredients look like. It's not, it's not foolproof, um, but it's a, a really good indication of what you need to be aiming for. So I think it's a mentality that, that we like as a business, uh, and it helps us to, to really 
um, address what we need to get right up front if if this is going to cut through to be something sustainable and and winning. Mm. You, 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 as a group, you've been very successful. You know, I've watched you guys for for many years. I've been fortunate to work with you on on a number of projects. How would you describe your leadership team? You know, what 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 it is about them that I guess makes them successful? Is it, is it about getting the right people around the table? Is it about kind of being able to make the right decisions? Is it about to anticipate what's going on? And and how has how has that leadership team um, performed over, I guess, the last sort of three or four months, which has probably been a pretty tough period for any leadership team? Well, a few questions in there. So that just how is the leadership team in general? I mean, a, a, a very resilient bunch of people. Um, and the, the one thing that's, that's really, you know, it's my, my good fortune to work with a group of people like this is that we have a, a very good camaraderie yet an ability to draw the line when it comes to, you know, hard business discussions. And there are some pretty feisty discussions that we've had over the years. And, um, and the reason for that is because everybody's got an opinion. Everyone's got a point of view and that matters. Because without it, you have group think and you can blindly take a direction that is unchallenged and that doesn't do anyone any good. So we have a, a good team dynamic in that sense. We have a mixed bag of personalities. You know, everyone over the years has been color profiled. So we have um, <clears throat> we have people who are red blue combinations. So that, you know, that's aggressive, a driver with that other component being the blue piece being <clears throat> having a cautious undertone to it and an analytical undertone to let's push it, but let's not, let's not be blind. Let's make sure the numbers are, are making sense. That's, that's one character. You've then got your, your kind of your, your green characters who are very people oriented and warm, humanistic in nature and, and your yellows who are bright and energy, bring energy into the room. So we've got a really good diverse, um, you know, personality group of people too, which, which is, always a pleasure to work with um, rather than, than having uh, everyone sort of clones. Um, and, you know, in amongst the group, there's a ton of experience as well. There's, most people have been in the business for the best part of two decades, if not more. Um, and, and that matters too, because, you know, we've, the, the, the mistakes that have been made in the past have been learned from um, the, the understanding that, mistakes might happen and we do need to learn from it as we go forward is is uh, is key and also to have the humility to look across at, at a peer and say okay that's that's best practice i'm i'm going to i'm going to steal that back and have it have it for for my territory so the cross the, the cross sharing of, of best practice from country to country is important too and we have some uh, you know we've also got diversity in the leadership team with um a balance of male and female too. We've got got um, got a number of female heads of department from finance to IT to marketing division. Um, so that, that really helps as well to create a, a nice rounded environment um, to work in. I forgot what your last question was there as well. Oh yes, you said leadership during the last three months or so. Yeah. That's well, right. I couldn't. Yeah. To be honest, I, I I couldn't be more proud, Matthew. To be honest, we we've got. Oh, I should mention communications. Our head of communications is a very strong female as well. Um, and, and that's, that's in my mind because communications has been everything in the last few months. Um, you know, when, when something is, looks black on Tuesday and it's white on Wednesday and it's black again on Thursday, that, that leaves people in a headspin where, where, hang on a minute. I thought this was happening and now this is happening. Um, you know, you get a lot of member sentiment just outpouring on, on the, on the, uh, in social media, you know, we've been. We've been bashed by a lot of comments for for things that have been broadly out of our control, but yet we've got to have the humility to apologise because it's you know it's not the the experience we wanted our members to have. Whether it's our fault, someone else's fault, we didn't want them to feel that way. So, um, so coming back to the point about leadership, the when we went into the sort of hard lockdown and and the you know really lockdown work from home. I can honestly say a, a pretty frantic pace in our business is is the norm, but it, it went up a notch. And to give you an example of some of the things that happened there, we we said collectively, right, where are we? What what can we do to maximize productivity of every individual in the business? Um, and I'll, I'll I'll cherry pick some really good examples. So, general managers um, in in Malaysia 
onto learning and development courses, given assignments and given uh, homework to check in with in, on, on a daily basis to measure productivity, to measure learning and development. So that's generic learning and development to come out of it a little bit more rounded, a little bit more knowledgeable. So when we get back, we're a bit of a better person than we were than we than we left. Um, take the Asia business as a whole. We made a decision that we were going to depart from one of our uh, software providers in uh, for um, lead management system and for uh, CRM. And we did that from a, from a cost saving perspective, but also from a an efficiency perspective. In fact, what we were using was was over engineered for our needs, and we wanted to to do something more fit for purpose. I shall not mention any any names. Um, but what we did was have everybody in every country um, get onto L&D platforms, learn the new software that we're putting in. Then in the background, our IT teams uh, migrated the data from the existing software that we're using. So this is all you know prospect leads that are sitting there, migrated into a new the new system so that when we started to open back up, five weeks from having an existing platform integrated into our backend software, having migrated all the data, integrated the new front end package, and having people back in the real world working on a new package just like that was seamless. And that was a fantastic example of what, what's possible when you've really put under pressure. And you know, nobody even saw each other. Everyone was at home. It was all done completely remotely, which is you know, that really makes you think, wow, when you get pushed to the extreme, you know, you're on sort of a war footing. What really is possible? So then you start to say, well, what what can we capture from this mentality, this kind of war footing mentality to take forward uh, into the next chapter? And I guess it's going to be a balance because we I, I don't think it's possible to work at that kind of pace and, and um, that uh, how frenetic that was uh, during the time. Um, but there are real key lessons there. Um, let me think of uh, other examples. Let me let me take Thailand's personal training example, which is um, which is fantastic. Um, personal trainers made no less than ten phone calls to their clients, asking, "Would you like a free session while you're at home over the over the internet?" Um, and many many people said yes. And then then of course there are a number of other people who were not PT clients being receiving the same call and having a similar experience. So a rapport started to build during this period that wasn't necessarily there um, prior with people who did not do personal training. Then when the clubs reopened, the teams um, engaged those people who had had those phone calls to say, hey, would you like a, a fitness assessment with the person who they'd been engaged with? So there's a, a familiarity there. Then a, a good number of those said, yeah, I'll do that. And then a really good number of those over indexing versus our normal numbers then said, hey, actually, I'd like to buy a personal training program with you. So our business there is is hitting records in in personal training conduction, and credit to um, Mark and the team there for setting a new standard and really shining a light on what what level of engagement you can go to in the most tricky of circumstances to have a payoff. And and really, it's kind of the um, uh, you know as, as Mark would describe it himself, the the law of reciprocity, where you know that that sowing the seeds of goodwill has a payoff. And on, on that point in general, by the way, I think that's we, we mentioned that many times. And just to come to, you know, communication right across the board and, and led, led centrally from uh, our head of communications, Jill, here in, in Malaysia. Um, we, we were very proactive in, in explaining to our staff uh, where we sat, what we wanted to do. And the position that we took was we want to sow as many seeds of goodwill with our membership base as we can now. So when we reopen, we have this kind of reciprocity and people people returning it to us and you know we're not open in enough markets or we're not we're not we haven't been open long enough to feel the full effects of that but thailand where we're closest to normal as possible that's certainly a measurable payoff which is which is really pleasing but in general uh, you know I, I give hand on heart full credit to the team for for their leadership during this time it's been you know it's been a privilege to to work with people like this who are so committed and I, I suppose, Matthew, you asked about you know the characteristics of the team. We have what we call winning ways or, or values in the business, and we have things like we you know we win together, we aim higher, and own it is one of the big ones. And I, and I think if I, there's probably one it, uh, that that everyone is a, an exemplar of, it's it's owning it. People own it as if it's their own business, and and will not let it go until until they feel that they, you know they've they've executed it on their best, and and that's. Again, you know, I think our, 
our owning companies who who change from time to time, but but I have people like that. Um, you know, it's it's they're fortunate that that we've got a team of executives and a team of people who work for them who can have that um, that personal ownership of their jobs and their tasks to to get it done. Mm. What have you found has been the, the the sort of sweet spot in terms of frequency and duration of, of of meetings where you you get together and go through that stuff? And has it changed? Um, yeah. Whilst you've gone through, this, you know, last few months, it's gone up, and uh, I've I've read around, and I've, I've, I think we're in the norm there. It seems to be uh, a pattern that, that many report. Um, so the, the frequency of engaging has increased, um, and it, again, it's 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 helped shine a light on you know what it means to be more agile and nimble and fast. I mean, I've I've always thought that we've we've been reasonably quick, um, but. No, I've decided that, that that there's a new bar, and and um, this concept of of agile, um, which is you know born from the sort of software development world, is something that we can um, we can do a lot better with internally. And um, I, I I don't know whether we'll do this virtually or when we can get together next, but I have it in my mind that I'd like to get get our teams together and actually do some group training in the concept of agile working to 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 move with this. You know this sort of matrix project-based kind of approach um, to ma- to making change happen. Uh, we've got a whole raft of new initiatives in the business. We call uh, EW 2.0, Evolution Wellness 2.0, which is a, a reinvention, which is in part a restructuring, rebasing some of our costs, um, because you know we we've got to expect that to be able to return to the level of revenue that we once had at our peak is is not not going to happen for some time. It, um, and and if we if we plan that, oh, yeah, we think we'll get there in a year or two years, that's dangerous. We have to plan not to get there and take actions such that we can uh, you know, reach respectable margins without having reached those levels of revenue. So what does that mean? That means being more efficient, means, means being more lean, using technology perhaps where we, we might have not done before, um, and having more of the people who we employ be in a revenue-generating position. So... That again is is on our current agenda, and uh, you know I'm sure we're not unique in that respect. I think pretty much every every company has got to be looking at things in that way. Mm. You've got well, from what I read, over seven thousand employees. Um, how have, have, have you managed to sort of keep a, a, quite a few of those on, or have you have you furloughed most of the ones that are working inside the facilities? No, I mean furloughing is not an option for us, uh, you know, per se over here. Um, so we um, we let go a number of people who were on probation, um, who sadly who had kind of just recently been employed. Um, there were a few hundred, in fact, uh, close to about four hundred people on probation. We had to just park for a while. Um, very painful to do that. They'd just been through a very exciting induction, and um, but we we simply couldn't afford to. To have an, an additional burden on the business, which could have, you know, taken us to a, a dangerous point. Um, now, the, the way um, our our compensation works is that there are a number of people who work for a salary, uh, and, and that's it. But there, most of our, our employees work for a salary and some performance pay. So, take for example a personal trainer. There will be a base salary, and then there'll be a variable earnings depending on, you know, the hours of personal training that they do. Now, instantly, those personal trainers have lost their variable pay. So all of the salaries were left 100% intact, um, and as is the you know the employment code anyway. Um, however, what we did do is we had a voluntary approach to those who were in um, <clears throat> support offices in particular, and on generally higher higher salaries. So if you take someone in the field, a, a someone who works in sales or someone who works in personal training. Their earnings had dropped by X, and, and in fact, the, the very best personal trainers who'd be doing the, the the highest number of hours, they would have had the biggest impact because their salary is broadly speaking similar to to others. Um, <clears throat> but those who were working for a higher salary were, were left unaffected. So we felt it more equitable if if you know there were people people took a, a voluntary um, reduction. And I say voluntary again because we have to follow. Um, uh, human resource codes of conduct and practice around the region, uh, which we did. And again, I'm very humbled that everybody got on board with that. Um, you know, a few people were kind of, you know, a bit, a bit put out by it, understandably when people have bills to pay and, and that kind of thing. Um, 
but the the level of compliance and buy-in and, and teamsmanship was was exemplary i have to say you know we had everybody going on board and and uh we're we're coming out of that now and getting to hopefully if we can you know uh make a billing run as we say in every market so we've got some revenue in every market hopefully we can we can look back on that and it's a thing of the past <clears throat> but as i said before we've got to we've got to revisit the cost structures so the pressure the fixed cost pressure is reduced in the business take 177 leases the biggest chunk of your cost is the rent cost then you've got your employment cost and then utilities on top of that okay utilities stop when you're you're closed Rent is a subject of negotiations. Some landlords have been very supportive. Some have been, you know, very inflexible. And and we there are a couple of clubs that we've closed actually. Um, maybe a couple more we will. I mean, if if it only ends up being four out of 177, I think we've done incredibly well. But that will be a direct result of how landlords are able to work with us. Um, you know, landlords have got difficulties as well. Let's 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 be clear. So. Um, nobody's got a magic pot of money, but what we're saying to landlords is, um, you know, if you can help us out now, at least we've got a chance to be a, a good, you know, paying customer going forward. We've for, for years, in some cases, decades, we've paid our rent on time every month, at, you know, the, the ideal tenant, if you like, never late and, and just, you know, a tenant that you'd expect to, to have, um, but when you have no revenue, there comes a point where if you keep doing that, then there's nothing left. So it's it's getting landlords to understand that is is important, and um, but equally having the the discipline to be able to say, well, you know, if 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 we're not able to do this, we're not able to renew the lease, and we we have to close. Um, and we've done that in a couple of cases, and I, I sincerely hope we don't need to do it anymore. But uh, for the sake of the business as a whole, we'll do it if we have to. Um, it's we're not we're not going to have a, a really significant economic drag from one or two locations that pulls the rest of the business down and and puts further pressure on people's compensation or you know people's livelihoods. That that that's not going to happen. So we'll we'll do what we need to do. Mm. Culture is clearly a, an important part of your organisation. With and with the I guess restrictions on being able to travel, you're in six. Is it six countries? Did you say or like yes. six, six? Six countries. Six countries. Yeah. Um, do, do you do you see that you'll have to look at other ways of of kind of continuing and supporting that that culture? And if so, what you know, what, what do you think you'll you'll do differently if you can't have those in person meetings and trainings and events that you've probably done in the past? Well, uh, you know, every country has a managing director who upholds the culture in, in their territory. Um, you know, I, I would travel about 33% of the time, but it's not me that makes that difference. Um, you know, I, it, it's me that reinforces it and lets everybody know that this is real because everybody lives and breathes this culture. So when we when we go and inspect what we expect, you know, people, if I'm in a club or I'm speaking to someone and I'm talking about things in a way that I would expect their their managing director to or their area business managers to, that just reinforces the culture. Um, you know, we can still do that remotely. So, I, I, you know, I see if, if things carry on uh, with the kind of restrictions we have for, for much longer, I can imagine that we will uh, engage in some more online platforms and some cross-sharing with our, our peer groups. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got good leadership teams in each country. So it, it's, not, uh, it, it's not a big difference in that sense. What, what is different is, of course, Personal contact is is the uh, the fuel and the reinforcement of personal relationships, and that's that to me is a, is a big loss. Uh, it's it's not something necessarily you 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 feel now, but I suspect when we when we do have FaceTime again, it's something that we'll probably realise, you know, just how different it was. Um, so I I, I I strongly believe in FaceTime and and. Um, spending time together, building personal bond, sharing experiences. It's, it's, it's really key for, for team dynamics. But the fact that we can see each other at the end of a line and we can do so frequently um, and talk and debate and, and you know, speak to information and screens that we can share is, is a massive, massive benefit. And um, you know, we, can, we can still do well with that in the interim. Mm. We talked about the leadership team that you're part of, but coming down to to you as a, as a leader, you know what what's it been like for you personally? Is it have you 
has it been a tough, tough few months? And and what are some of the things that you know have you had to gain, learn new information yourself? And and are there any things that you've had to, I guess, grow into or change and adapt to, to I suppose, to to continue to be the best CEO that you can be? Um. I could I could sit here and say you know give you the whole rah rah speech um, about about how we ride through these times and and I would be a fraud. It's been miserable, it, 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 you know, in in general, um, because the pressure has been there every day. And 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 why I, I don't mean to play down the whole thing. We that that when I use the word miserable, I mean it it feels like that at times. It, it can be very dark at times when you you know you can project this this level of threat and think you know what what could the worst case scenario be that's what's miserable about it mm. but then you 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 reflect and say well what what can we control what is within our w- within our domain that we can do something about and in the first instance whether it's good or bad the first thing that you can control is communication and because if, if people don't have any information good or bad then things start to happen and people will kind of speculate and assume and then they may talk to someone else with that speculation and that assumption. And then you end up with um, false information that might be damaging. So at least if it's, you know, at least if it's not the great news, you can always you can always back end the news that you give if it's bad with this is what we're going to do about it. And this is what we're going to do to be more prepared and to be to put our members at ease and to give our members reassurance. So whatever it is, controlling communication is essential. So. Um, I, you know, I've always felt that communication is important, and and I also feel that um, access to senior management is important. You know, when you look at what what people rate as the most important things in being being in any given company, you find that compensation normally comes around about number seven, as long as there are other opportunities to be a part of something bigger, um, to see an opportunity for me to contribute and to grow. And then there's this thing about access to senior management where people want to hear, well, what's happening? You know, what's, what's happening? What, what's the vision? Where are we, where are we being taken to? Where are we steering towards next? So being able to communicate and share information is, is crucial. And uh, in fact, speaking to my head of communications this week, talking about, you know, it's time we put out another, another communication uh, at, at this end in our support office. And I elected to wait just a little bit because I felt with, with September around the corner, I, I think we're going to be billing in a couple more markets, which would mean we can front end that with a bit more optimism, right? Um, uh, so I've kind of cheekily stole a couple of weeks there because I, I've, I would much rather be able to come back with that to say, we've been through this particularly tough patch. Now we've got billing in this market. We've switched back on our revenues in this market. Members are coming back. These are the statistics. This is This is why it's been worth you know, hanging, hanging out through this and being resilient and knuckling down in the meantime. Um, so communication and, and being proactive with it has been, has been key, but it's, you know, it's far from just me. It's, it's our heads of department and it's our country managers that are the principal communicators with their, with their teams on a more, on a more routine basis. Mm. Uh, and and what, just in terms of leadership sorry. in general, to, to answer your question, um, the, I, I think what what's what's been reinforced is is that when when we're at a distance, um, you, you can't you can't pick up on just the body language. And, and when you're in a room with people or you're in a club with people, you can you can read people's moods and you can read people's energy. You can walk into a club if it's not doing well. You can feel it within five meters of walking. You can just feel it. You can feel the energy in the air that there's something not quite right here. Conversely, when a club is pumping, you can also feel that. And, and that might be trading pressure or, or you know, some management dynamics or whatever it is. You can't feel that when you're, when you're at the end of a line like this. Mm. Um, it's just a narrative that you're taking on board. So I think that, that, that asking open-ended questions and really probing and getting a, wide, a wider view uh, from as many members in the team as possible um, is is perhaps more important to get perspective Um, because at times like this, you you know, like I say, you you can, you know, taking a country visit, sitting down with a a group of 20 people, just engaging in non-business subjects, you can read how people feel about things just on their general mood, how jovial they are, how engaging they are. You can't do that when you, when you, you don't, you don't have the ability to meet again. So that extra degree of, of, 
uh, open-ended questions really matters, which speaks to our leadership philosophy, really, which is all about a coaching mindset. Hmm. So with, with I, I, in preparation for this, I read up, um, I think I think there's an article in Health Club Management, actually, not too long ago, where, or prior, I think it was probably beginning of the year, end of last year, where you'd sort of set out the various different brands and initiatives and some of the acquisitions that you were involved in. And it, it you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty impressive. And you seem to have covered all bases within the, the you know, the sort of fitness space and, and probably more broadly, you know, well, wellness, I guess, with, with the yoga side and the, and the nutrition. Um, what, what do you think now um, is as we start to maybe come out of this in some some respects? You know, do, do you think those, um, you know, that that strategy is going to need to change? And if so, is is it? Have you got enough information to really understand probably which, which one of those are going to be uh, you're sort of developing a lot more than others, or are you still at a, at a stage where you know just wait and see and until you've got more information about you know, what, what, what the, the sort of this, this normal world is going to look like? Well, there's, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that the, the, uh, the mental wellness agenda is going, to, is going to rise. You know, every year, um, you know, you being uh, uh, an industry veteran as well, you'll be familiar with the annual reports that come out to see the top, you know, the top 20 sort of trending, trending topics. And, and they, they, it's like the, you know, it's like the, the music charts that they just they just vary a little bit and you know, what's dropped into number one we've had our we've had our hit phase and and then you start to get this sort of recovery piece um i believe that that we're going to get into the the sort of low inflammation low oxidative stress kind of workout regimes next as as particularly as people have, have realized that well maybe doing hit five times a week is perhaps what my knees ordered um but 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 really to come back to the to the bigger point um, and and the particular impact that this this COVID situation's had, um, having people kind of locked away hinders hinders people's human connection. Therefore, this community aspect that that our business provides, irrespective of the modality of your training, your engagement, I think the community aspect is something that will will shine back strongly again. Thirty eight percent of our members. Who are principally female in, in this in this cohort rate the social activity, the social connected piece, as their number one reason for engagement. So they might be engaging around a zumba or yoga or whatever it is, but the social piece is massive. It, it transcends every modality of, of exercise. But then coming back to what we read and what we hear about the the state of mental wellness, people being locked away, the social aspect, the 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 worry, the anxiety that you know this this dark period has brought upon us that provides an opportunity for the awareness as to what the the more wellness kind of uh, um, classes or programs offer being mindfulness meditation yoga breathing that kind of thing just bringing everybody on everyone back down um, releasing anxiety being able to process thoughts and clear the mind and move on I think there's an enormous opportunity there, both in the in the the bricks and mortar space and online. I'll give you an example: Five Elements, which is our wellness brand um, that uh, we acquired a couple of years ago, which started as a fantastic retreat hotel in Bali. Uh, we we worked on the, the brand architecture to to create something we call Five Elements Habitat, and we took that into Hong Kong um, a year and a bit ago. That's in Times Square, and a very busy very busy part of Hong Kong. You know, you come out from the, the MTR, just just a, a conveyor belt of people coming out there and, and the streets are particularly busy. There's a hustle and bustle. You then walk into the environment and instantly your shoulders just drop. It's a, it's an entirely different space and it has people and, and a talent in there that delivers something very, very special. Like, it's very hard to describe if, and particularly to people who might be, you know, crossfitters or to 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 you know that that kind of group to walk into that environment is is a very very different thing and then you you look at what what's available in there we've got a we've got a tea master um who who is her name is Resham she's she's fantastic and she she runs tea meditation sessions so she will have corporates in there of up to 10 people she might do it in small groups but they will spend an hour or even two uh, drinking tea in a very mindful way, sometimes more or less in silence, sometimes just spoken, 
general chat, understanding the journey of tea, how it makes you feel. Um, if you imagine, you know, in the hedonistic world, people go to wine tasting and how does it taste? How does it mm -hmm. make you feel? What's the, yeah. all of that kind of thing. Imagine the same with, with the highest quality organic teas that's from the, um, you know, the hills of China, for example. Um, she will do the same thing. And she's, she's been running as part of our five elements online. She's been running some virtual tea, uh, tea meditation sessions and people have been joining in online to have that connection again. And to have that guided process where they can sit down, find peace, find calm, and and uh, and have that moment. So, you know, how how amazing is that? That that's a that's an opportunity that opens up. And and when you have a brand like Five Elements with the talent that it attracts, and we have there, um, you know, we're really privileged to be able to be in that thought leadership space. And we wish to we wish to carry on and and spread that as far and wide as we can. So we see a lot of opportunity there in particular. Um, helping people just to cope with um, these difficult times. Mm. And do you say, you know, if you projected, let's say, 12 or 24 months, assuming there's no vaccine for, for, for this, do you, do you still see, and you, and you made, made an interesting point about the community, you know, I, I certainly feel that I can work out like you, you know, you can, you can work out anywhere pretty much, you know, enough about working out to pick up some dumbbells or a sandbag and do something, but it's it's not quite the same as, as just, you know, meeting people and having that connection. Do, do you think that, um, that, you know, assuming there is no change, that that, that, that is still somehow going to find a way to, to thrive, even if it's in conjunction with some sort of, you know, maybe less frequency or, 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 or digital element? Um, but it, it, you predict that those, you know, those physical locations are, 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 are going to sort of be here regardless of, of, of what, what happens, do you think? Well, um, another book I like is a book called Economics is the Answer to Everything. And there's, that's very relevant in this case because society has a way of, of finding out what works economically and, and then things start to thrive. So what worked economically before may be compromised now for, for a short while, for a long time, for an even longer time, I don't know. But in the interim, the the adaptation that will take place will be vast. And landlords will have to respond in the way that they, they consider the, the cost associated with what it is that we provide in the bricks and mortar world. There'll be a lot more experimentation, a lot more um, innovations and adaptations, and things will start to find a way. Things will start to get traction. And when things get traction, they will kind of burgeon and you know bubble up and People will then start to follow, and and I I don't know exactly where that's going to go. I don't, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball. But again, to put my optimist hat on, it, let's just look at the backdrop of society, particularly in this part of the world where I am in Malaysia at the moment. The levels of, of obesity are are they're off the charts. They're in the 40th percentile. Diabetes is in in double digits and growing year on year. Um. And in fact, again, let, let's just look at some of the statistics that come out of the industry. You, and, and this is where I think, you know, I get a little bit frustrated and, and think we, what, what more can we do about this? Because the backdrop of, of um, the, the general health of society, the rising healthcare costs and the fact that governments are concerned about not being able to, to fund what the future predicts for healthcare costs. Um, what, what can we do to have an impact on that now? And how can we, how can we use our expertise? And, you know, the, in our case, the nearly 7,000 staff that we've got to do something about that. So, um, again, just talking about this only yesterday, um, we're, we're, um, hatching some plans to get involved at the school level on an extracurricular basis. Uh, we were talking about, um, kids who are under lockdown, um, in Hong Kong. I heard that, 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 um, Teachers are wanting to have them exercise first. First thing they do is exercise vigorously to wear people out so they can sit down in front of a screen and focus. That's quite interesting. And I think that's an opportunity. I'm not talking about monetizing. I'm talking about, you know, that, that law of reciprocity again, seeding our, our brand, getting our instructors in front of people and providing that as a, as a service for free. Um, mm. So, so there's, this opens up loads of other opportunities, most of which we haven't even come across yet most of which mm. we haven't thought about so i think the amount of adaptation is is going to be huge the the virtual piece 
of course, there'll be more exploration and, and adaptation there. But to say that you know bricks and mortar is over, it, it'll never recover. I just I just don't buy it. That's like saying that that restaurants will shut down and all we'll do is live off takeaways forever. Um, I can't I can't really see that being the case. Society in general um, is is very resilient and very adaptive, and I'm sure we'll see our industry thrive in different ways. We've just mm. got to be resolute that we will keep that change mindset. I was saying this to to um, a group the other day that um, you can't. There's no playbook for what we have now. No one's ever done this before. You can't pick up a how-to manual. It doesn't exist. Um, but the one thing that everybody really needs is is the the you know change is, is the the only um, permanent constant. And if if we keep that in mind and we keep this change mindset, so that every time it's you know it's, traffic lights red, now it's green, now it's red, now it's green. If we if we kind of get worn out with that, um, that's not going to serve us well. We've got to expect it to. We've got to anticipate it to chop and change, and then to keep that resilient mindset to say, right, what's in my control? What can we do about this? What's the the way to win with the circumstances that we have now? Um, and I think if if that's the mindset we can keep, um, that's the mindset that's going to help us all win. Mm. It's, it's it's an interesting one. I, I love the part you say about kids. I've got a couple of kids that are doing homeschooling and. Um, I think you're right, you know, before you sit them in front of a computer, and unless I've had them running up and down the stairs or around the, around the block, you know, they're not going to sit there for five minutes. And, and, and I guess what, it, what, what this situation has done for me is, is realise that the governments have no clue about health and fitness. You know, if you look at the leader of, you know, in, in the UK, he, he was admittedly obese and he has admitted that he needs to get into shape to be able to deal with, you know, if, if anything happens again. And so I think that... The leaders in countries don't really know what to do. They know they know how to cure you and medicate you and, and that sort of stuff, but they don't. They're not doing a good job at necessarily advising people, from what I've seen anyway, in terms of how to prevent and to build resilience and strength and and everything that you need to do. And I suppose it it seems as though it's for people, you know, leaders like you know, in your group and 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 people who's I, I guess master their craft. You know, it, it probably allows the the, the people who who work hard and um, I guess are very good at what they do to to have the opportunity to stand up and to make a difference and I, and I suppose the economics um, would would automatically go with that but I, I guess I mean I certainly see a shift from an industry that was very much about um, you know sort of six packs and biceps to to potentially becoming an industry where it can make a real difference in people's lives um, on, on so many ways. I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, yeah, I agree. I, I don't think that we have done, this is, you know, self-criticism. I don't, I don't think we've done enough, anywhere near enough, for the education of general society about healthy living and to use the, the much overused word lifestyle. You know, people talk about a lifestyle brand. Well, what, what does it mean to be a lifestyle brand? A lifestyle brand is something that, that, that is baked into your what you do, your way of work. It gives you more utility in, in every day. So um, if, if we can, whatever, again, whatever the modality, whether it's yoga, whether it's a kid's class, whether it's just education, we need to be able to get across to more and more people. As an example, take the the penetration levels of the Western world, and we hear of you know Australia, US, sixteen percent, whatever it may be, in in the the health club world, of racket sports are a bit different, etc. But if you look at which ones have the best penetration and the best retention, they are what you might describe as the genuine lifestyle brands because they're the brands that people can genuinely build your life around. So take a take a, a family health club that might have uh, racket sports, it might have a couple of swimming pools and massive capital investment. And not something that that you know the average person can turn to and say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to create a big, you know, um, multi-sports lifestyle facility. But they do well, and people seldom leave them because people can build their lives around them. Mm -hmm. That you know, it, they may actually get away with slightly inferior service in certain areas, or they may get forgiven for certain things because um, uh, you know that it just ticks all of the boxes when it comes to this has got what I need. It's I can get there within a reasonable commute. My sons and daughters can go there. We can be there as a family on a weekend. Um, so what does that mean for, for other brands? What does that mean for boutiques? What does it mean for low-cost gyms? 
if if they're a convenience and they're at the low cost end where I don't really need to think about it, then that probably takes care of that piece of engagement. But when it when you start to pay a little bit more mid to upper market to premium, then if I'm going to carry on doing this, I've I've got to be engaged in a way that's just beyond utility, just beyond that's that's a really good workout. I perhaps need to have a little bit of community. What does that mean? That means that someone speaks to me every time I go. It means that I've got a human connection, be it a member or be it a staff member. So uh, as businesses, we need to facilitate those introductions to human connection, whether they be little social events every now and then, even if it's just a welcome to a new person at the beginning of a class and an introduction to the rest of the group. And there's no reason why the bigger the bigger players can't do that. That's not an exclusive right of the boutiques that that well we're we're a boutique therefore we'll be we'll be nicer to our customers than everybody else. That's just a choice. That's just an attitude and a mindset. So I think there are a lot more opportunities there as well. But back onto this point about education, um, one of the and I, I guess it speaks to one of your early questions. Um, it really fuels my resolve to do to do something about that uh, because I, I think that the the education piece is the key um, to shatter some of the myths about. Uh, that, that surround exercise and nutrition and just to get people engaged, to get to give people that feeling um, because the penetration levels are, are particularly low. I, I kind of sidetracked myself there, but in the West, the penetration levels are high because of the engagement over here. Um, they're low uh, by comparison. And, and, you know, in some of our markets, they're still in the five, six and sevens. You read about one and two percent in Indonesia, for example, but that's a misleading statistic. You, if you talk about the, the whole Indonesian archipelago, then of course the penetration is pretty low. But when you look at Java, uh, central Jakarta, for example, um, th- those numbers are, are a bit higher, but still there's a long way to go to, to, to meet the West. And it's not all about disposable income and affordability. It's about awareness and about a consideration. Well, could this be something for me? So uh, education is going to be a big one. And um, sowing those seeds of goodwill uh, with the the um, the more marginalised communities, the the kids, uh, I think that's something that that we can play a big part in. Mm. Fantastic. Well, well, final question, Simon. It, we've, we've covered quite a bit of ground <laughs> in the last sixty minutes, but um, just just the final question I'd like to answer you. Ask you, um, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. Uh, what would you say would be a a memorable, a memorable example of you escaping your own personal limits. Gosh, that's uh, that one needs a lot of reflection, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I, I suppose, um, you know, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not one particularly for talking about personal journeys, but um, I'm very privileged to be in the position I'm, I'm in with. A staff of nearly 7,000 and a fantastic leadership team, six brands in six different countries. And, you know, if if I think about my background, I wasn't, you can't say I was destined to be there. You know, my, my family are from very humble origins. My um, <clears throat> grandparents were, from, you know, from the mining community in the UK. Um, my parents were tremendously hardworking and, you know, saved and saved and saved, bought the best house they could decorated the house themselves, did it room by room by room until it was beautiful. And, and you know, I think that's been instilled in me is, is the, the work hard ethic. And so I think that the um, it's not necessarily a limitation that was ever placed, but I think that the, again, it's a mindset. If, if just, just knuckling down, showing up, you know, get certified, take a course every now and then, be a little bit better next year than you were last year. I think that's a way to to um, to work without limits, and that's something that that is available to to many. Um, so I think that we we should uh, not think about what limitations. I, I think it's a question that, that we shouldn't really ask. There don't need to be any limitations as long as we have the mindset to to give it a shot, show up, take a course, and put an extra hour in the most people, and, and the opportunities are, are there to go places. And I'm I'm I feel really fortunate that. Uh, it comes with a lot of luck and it's a lot of good timing. Um, but I think the message is just, just knuckle down and the opportunities are there. So, yeah, that, I think that would be my reflection. Fantastic. Well, Simon, thank you so much. It's been, um, it's been 
a, a very enjoyable conversation. I've certainly learned a lot. I've been scribbling down some notes from my own business, and I'm, I'm sure whoever listens to this will, uh, will, will certainly take a lot away. So I, I thank you for, for, for investing your time in, um, in the interview today, and I, I wish you uh, best of luck for the future, Simon. Thank you, Matthew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.